I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is traveling to Taiwan. Congressman Mark DeCano joined Speaker Nancy Pelosi for that controversial trip. He's with us to take us inside the room. Then, one of the most connected and followed journalists in politics, Peter Hamby of Snapchat and Puck News, is with us in studio. The issues are Liz Cheney loses in a landslide. What's the message Republicans, Democrats, and the media should learn from this? President Biden is getting legislative win after win, so why do so many Californians want him to retire? Plus, social media has completely transformed politics. Where are we headed next? The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson, and one of the thorniest issues internationally is China's relationship with Taiwan. Taiwan, of course, says it's an independent country of 23 million. China says Taiwan is a part of China. Recently, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of San Francisco led a delegation of lawmakers to Taiwan, including Congressman Mark Takano of Riverside. They met with the Taiwanese president, even though the U.S. technically does not have a formal diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. After that trip, China punished Taiwan by intensifying military drills in the waters surrounding the island. China also sanctioned some of Taiwan's trade with China. Joining us now to talk about it is Congressman Mark Takano, of course, traveled to Taiwan. He's a member of the Asian Pacific American Caucus and is the chair of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. Congressman Takano, welcome back to The Issue Is, and thank you very much for joining us from your trip to Hawaii. Uh, it looks beautiful behind you. <laughs> it's beautiful here, and I'm taking a moment out before I, what I know is going to be a very, very vigorous next few weeks. Yeah, it will be, but let's first talk about where you have been. Why this Taiwan trip, and why right now? The trip to Asia was something the speaker had long planned. We planned to go back in January. Uh, and the COVID uh, surge here in our country put a damper on that. We tried to go back in April, uh, and the speaker got COVID. Uh, and we rescheduled for uh, August. And of course, we had to be very fuzzy about whether we actually were going to go to Taiwan uh, for security reasons. But this was, uh, this was something that uh, an Asia trip to Asian democracies was something that uh, uh, we had long planned, and uh, the future of the century uh, for America uh, is going to depend uh, on our greater, greater engagement uh, in this region. Taiwan will not be isolated. The United States uh, of America, the people of the United States, the Congress is united in ways that we haven't seen the Congress united in quite a while. I mean, it really is remarkable to see so many Republicans ba backing Nancy Pelosi on anything <laughs> they are on this. But we also know that China is hugely powerful uh, and very deeply invested in America's economy. And there were these reports about some dissension in the Biden administration with you doing this. Did President Biden ask you all not to go on this trip? President Biden never told Speaker Pelosi don't go. He never said that. Uh, there may have been others in the administration who disagreed with our going, but President Biden uh, did not. We flew on a blue and white plane and very ably, ably piloted, by the way. I can't get into much of the de details, but the Chinese were, they were messing with us. Uh, and I can't get into details of that, but they were, they were doing things to interfere with our getting there. But, you know, 250,000 Taiwanese were following us. Uh, they were following the trajectory of our plane. There was some way in which they were able to do that through uh, aeronautics and the way that they track planes. So are you suggesting that China's military was actively doing things to your plane while it was in the air to try to stop you from landing? Well, Alex, I can't say much more. I, I, all I can say to you is that, uh, uh, is that we were very much aware that the, uh, the Chinese did not want to see us go. Uh, wow. And we asserted that we were doing very much what other congressional delegations done, what other speakers have done, other speakers of the House, that this was not a change to the status quo. Were you scared about landing? Were you concerned for your safety? Um, I had a high, very high degree of confidence in our military and all the precautions they were taking. Um, nevertheless, uh, the delegation did join in hands uh, and uh, Chairman Meeks of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Speaker asked him to lead us in a prayer. And he prayed and said, uh, and he framed it in terms of uh, good trouble, that what we were doing was getting into good trouble in the terms of uh, John Lewis, 
uh, that uh, we are standing up for a plucky democracy. And we're not going to allow that democracy to be isolated. And we're not going to allow a new normal to be established, a new status quo. Uh, we are simply abiding by the present status quo. And we're not going to allow that to change. That's the good trouble we were getting into. I'm sure Congressman Lewis would be, we'd be proud of you for that. Uh, I want to talk about another topic now. Uh, you are the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, and you just had a big bill that was your bill that the president signed. Uh, it's called the PACT Act. Got a lot of attention. This has to do with veterans impacted by burn pits overseas, making sure that they get uh, the health care that they deserve. We know John Stewart got involved in trying to get this thing passed uh, through the Senate. There were some roadblocks there. Um, you were there front row, watching this legislation get signed, your legislation. What was that like for you to see this become law? Enormously, enormously proud moment for me. I have to say, if I do anything equal or greater than uh, getting something like the PACT Act signed for law, I will, be a, I will feel very fortunate in terms of a legislative career. Uh, this is one, this is the biggest piece of legislation that I've been behind. But uh, more than that, I think about the 3.5 million veterans uh, and the victory this is for them, the anxiety they no longer have to feel about whether their families are going to be taken care of, that they uh, should get a debilitating illness associated with these burn pits. There was so much more to this bill than the burn pits, uh, Alex. We also declared 23 new presumptive illnesses. Uh, and uh, this is a big, big healing moment. Uh, for a country that's been through 20 years of conflict, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And the global war on terror extends beyond that. Highlight of your career so far? I would say it's the highlight of my career. This is a, this is a huge moment for our country, and I, I believe it, it can bring our country together. Let's hope so, because we need more unity in this country. Congratulations. We do. Uh, that is something thank to be you. really proud of. Congressman Mark DeCano, thank you so much, and enjoy Hawaii. Thank you. Up next, Peter Hamby of Snapchat and Puck News on a variety of issues, including Liz Cheney's landslide loss. Stay with us. This primary election is over, but now the real work begins. That should be the presidential run. Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney lost the Republican primary this week. Of course, she's the vice chair of the January 6th committee. She supported President Trump's impeachment. She was defeated by a Trump-backed challenger by nearly 40 points. Remember, Wyoming's primary is closed to Republicans only. In California, Republican David Valadeo also voted for President Trump's impeachment. He barely survived the primary year. But remember, California has an open primary where anyone from any party can vote. Let's talk about that and more with one of the most smartest and most connected guys in the entire country. Peter Hamby is with us for the first time. Peter has a huge following on Snapchat. More than 2.5 million people subscribe to Peter's daily political show on Snapchat. It's called Good Luck America, because God knows we need it. Uh, he also hosts a daily podcast called The Powers That Be. This is for Puck News, which he's one of the co-founders of. Puck focuses on the power players in Washington, Silicon Valley, New York, and Hollywood, how it all sort of comes together. Peter, welcome in studio. Great to have you here. It's great to be here. I've only done this on Zoom. Yeah, uh, so we, we appreciate that. I love the podcast. I listen to it all the time. Uh, it's very smart. And this week when you were talking about Liz Cheney, you, you talked about the Liz Cheney MSNBC fantasy, which is a hilarious <laughs> title for a podcast. <laughs> seems like there's a real disconnect between the way some people in Washington, New York, even L.A. see Liz Cheney and the way actual voters see Liz Cheney. That's right. There's a term in Washington called strange new respect. Uh, when someone from the other team, the other party, suddenly turns around and you agree with them. And Liz Cheney embodies that. Um, when she voted to impeach Trump, uh, when she joined the select committee in the House to investigate January 6th, suddenly... Democrats loved her. This is the daughter of Dick Cheney. A uh, lifelong Republican, voted with Trump 96% of the time, and yet she became a fixation in Washington for the press, for Democrats. But she's a woman without a party. I mean, the Republican Party is fully owned by Donald Trump at this point, or his disciples, Ron DeSantis, Carrie Lake, et cetera. And Democrats, at the end of the day, wouldn't vote for 
uh, wouldn't vote for her for president, um, even though they might send her money, as a lot of Democrats did in the primary. So you think that the prospect of her running for president to essentially block mm -hmm. Donald Trump actually would be good for Donald Trump, and her running as a third party would be good for Donald Trump, too. I think both would be good for Donald Trump. The, the reality is that if Trump runs and he's sending all the signals he will, the only way he's going to lose a Republican primary is a head-to-head -head race against someone who runs a great campaign, a head-to-head -head against Ron DeSantis. But that's it, because think back to 2016, even if, if a bunch of people run, they all divide the vote, Donald Trump gathers a plurality, et cetera, et cetera. We know the end of that story. And then again, a third party, if she decides to run as a third party in 2024, Democrats need those people, those suburbanites, women, some suburban men in those swing states, they need them to vote for Democrats like they right. did for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting on the fence and they're voting for a third party, they're not taking votes from Republicans, they're taking votes from Democrats. And we saw that again in 2016. Well, let's talk about Donald Trump's strength right now because there are at least four investigations happening at the same time <laughs> that could you know, lead to him behind bars. Uh -huh. And yet he keeps getting stronger and stronger, so much so that the people that are likely running against him now are putting out statements of support of him right. after this Mar-a-Lago raid. First of all, I don't think it's fundamentally good that Donald Trump is under investigation on multiple fronts and maybe broke the law. Like, I don't think that helps his chances winning a general election the next time around. But in a Republican primary, you know, he's like a superhero where you attack him and it makes him stronger. He, he needs something to run against. Like, he defines the term negative partisanship in American politics. They're out to get me. They're out to get you. The deep state is investigating me. And because, remember, he's deplatformed. He's not on Twitter or Facebook, all these, all these platforms anymore. He needs some kind of oxygen to get the mainstream media to talk about him. And this investigation is a perfect example of that. And, and to your point, I mean... Even Mike Pence, who's turned on Donald Trump, is now coming out and defending him against this FBI investigation. Well, and, and meanwhile, Joe Biden is kind of the opposite, right? He likes <laughs> to be kumbaya, let's all get together, bipartisan. He's uncomfortable running against somebody else. Uh, he's had all these legislative wins. I mean, yeah. significant legislation. And yet it's not really helping him in the polls. A little bit of an uptick mm -hmm. in the polls. Uh, but we, we have some new numbers that just came out at the end of this week uh, here in California. This is the Berkeley IGS poll. Should Biden run in 2024? 61% of Californians say no. 31% say yes. Among Democrats, it's 46-46. Why do you think that Biden... Uh, is not getting more credit, not getting people more excited based off of what he's doing. One, he said, I was elected to just get rid of Donald Trump. That was the bargain. I don't think people thought much more deeply about what they wanted him to do. Um, so there's that. Two, um, his weakest spot in the polls right now uh, among Democrats is young people. They were never in love with him, enamored with him in the first place. They didn't think he uh, would or has taken uh, progressive enough steps on a variety of issues, and not just student loans, uh, the economy, uh, health care, climate, even though he has. Um, so that gets to the third problem, which is communication. Um, the big bill he just passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, has more money invested in climate and greening the U.S. economy than, like, than any bill that's ever been passed. But a lot of people just don't know that. And part of this is that a lot of the bills he's been passing are long tail bills. People won't see the effects of these for a long time to come. Whereas with inflation, grocery prices, mm -hmm. gas prices, people see that every day. Every and day. And they're like, who do I blame? I don't know, the guy in, in, in office. To, to that point though, Joe Biden doesn't give almost any TV interviews. He is not somebody who's a big user of social media himself. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not taking advantage of a lot of different ways that he could communicate, but there are other people who are. And let's get to this question from that Berkeley poll. This is really interesting mm -hmm. because all these people think that Biden shouldn't run. So who should run for president? Among California Democrats, Gavin Newsom, number one, at 13%, tied with Bernie Sanders at 13%, Kamala Harris, in third place, the vice president of the United States at 10. What's your reading on that? My read there is Newsom, and you know him better than I do, but he's, he's made this sort of gamble that we live in a very combative, partisan, polarized atmosphere. And unlike President Biden, who wants to make a phone call to Mitch McConnell and who wants to pass some bipartisan legislation, Newsom is running ads in Florida. He's throwing punches it's at Republicans. And the base really seems to like that. Um, mm -hmm. And Newsom is also 
pretty good. I wouldn't say he's the like smoothest dude in the world. He can be a little stiff, but he gets social media. Like he's yeah. he's dropping video clips all over TikTok and YouTube, and um, you don't see that from President Biden very much. Again, because those formats are not his place. He likes to read David Brooks columns and, and right. you know like watch NBC Nightly News. Well, and the advantage, <laughs> of course, for Gavin Newsom is he's got Democratic super majorities, yes. so he can do whatever he wants. Right. Whereas Joe Biden's got a 50-50 Senate and could soon be losing the House. Uh, that gets to the, the sort of the question about the midterms. I think one of the most interesting questions going forward for the midterms here in California is. What issue is going to be top of mind? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be crime and homelessness, which mm -hmm. would potentially add advantageous to like Rick Caruso running for mayor mm -hmm. of Los Angeles or Sheriff Alex Villanueva? Mm -hmm. Or is it some of these national issues that Democrats are excited about? Mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade, Donald Trump, uh, and does it become more of a national election? How do you see things? I mean, I think at the end of the day, every election depends on the economy first and foremost. And by the economy, I don't mean home sales or the unemployment rate. It's just how people feel about it. Um, and gas prices, again, being a good example, inflation. Um, but I, I find it really interesting, too, and I don't have a clean answer for this. I mean, before the mayoral primary, uh, I thought Rick Caruso would actually do better than he did mm -hmm. um, against Karen Bass. And part of that is I live in Venice, so I see a lot of the homelessness and crime issues that were being discussed in TV ads, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sort of like, for people who know Venice, kind of live near that Gold's Gym. Uh, that's my precinct, like off of Rose Avenue. At the end of the day, the economy just kind of always is. Is there enough jingle jangle in people's pocketbooks? You yeah. know, and I think that defines elections. By the way, on the weekends, you can see Peter pumping iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger at the, <laughs> Gold's, at the Gold's Gym over there. I did bump into Martin O'Malley there one time. Oh, he wow. loves the Gold's Gym every time he's in LA. Not quite as cool Not as, as Arnold cool. Not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, Peter Hamby on how technology has changed politics, media, and so much more. So much secondhand news these days. But first, the Above Los Angeles Instagram town takes us above Big Sur. How beautiful is that? I say that as somebody who uh, used to be the young, shiny, cool guy, but uh, <laughs> now is the gray-haired, old, grizzled vet. Yeah, the gray is pretty rad. <laughs> that is uh, Peter Hamby talking to former President Barack Obama on his Snapchat show, Good Luck America. Peter's show has two and a half million subscribers. He's long been ahead of the game when it comes to media and politics. Peter is, is still with us here. Uh, Peter, what do you think is sort of the way to communicate to people now, especially young people? What's the sort of best advice you can give to people to better get a message out? <sighs> For journalists, I think it's incumbent just to be yourself and authentic. Be smart, serious, authoritative, do all the rigorous work of journalism. Like, I do a show on Snapchat, but I'm not showing up like that Steve Buscemi skateboard meme and saying, how do you do, fellow kids? Yeah. I'm just <laughs> doing interviews, uh, and I think the audience respects it. Um, for politicians, this is really interesting. Obama's a great example of this. Uh, I talked to Obama's chief digital officer when he was in the White House. Obama started putting out these Spotify playlists every year, every year. He loves Spotify, he loves music. He wrote them all himself. And most of the stuff he did on digital, he's comfortable with it. He has young daughters who use these different platforms. I've also worked with Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. And it's just like, they're not as comfortable in these spaces. And so for politicians, the number one thing, just have a message. Whether you're a candidate, know why you're running. If you're governing, like, be clear and concise about what you're doing while governing. And then take that message in whatever way you can to the different platforms, but don't like betray yourself and try to be cool just because you're doing a show on Snapchat or you know, try to have some different voice on Twitter. Like Joe Biden doesn't write his own tweets and that's fine, um, but he does need to find a way to get his surrogates to do that kind of thing for him on the platform. Where do you think all of that is going? What's next in that space? Oh, that's tough. The number one thing, and this, this scares me a little bit because I think you and I are similar in this way. It's like the younger generations increasingly, and lots of surveys show this, trust people over brands. In other words, like I follow Peter Alex on Twitter, but I don't really care that much about Fox LA. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but like journalists have to thread the needle between doing both, and I think that can be difficult. Um, there's a lot of first-person creators out there on the internet who are peddling disinformation and junk uh, and masquerading as journalists, and 
you know, actual journalists have to figure out the balance between I work for CNN, but I also have a following on Snap, TikTok, Instagram, or whatever. Um, and I think the younger generation is more looking toward the latter. When we come back, Peter plays personal issues and we learn his favorites. We go to break with Above Los Angeles, Above Pismo Beach, and music from Bon Iver. We play a game on this show called Personal Issues. Okay. This is our chance to get to know you a little bit better. We're talking with Peter Hamby of Snapchat and Puck News. We put 30 seconds up on the clock. We get your favorites. First thing that comes to mind, don't linger on anything too long. You ready? Yeah. Okay, favorite TV show? Oh, we're rewatching Broad City right now and it's living up to all, Best all the- all Favorite the... book? Oh, uh, this, you're gonna like this. Uh, the Powers That Be by David Halberstam. That's the name of my podcast. It's a history of basically media in the 50s and 60s and the oh, titans cool. of media. What is your favorite band? Uh, two answers, the band. Mm. And this is a little different, but LCD Sound System. And what's your favorite sports team? Uh, <laughs> this is Georgetown Hoyas basketball, but I grew up a Reds fan. I'm still a Cincinnati Reds fan. It's hard not to live in LA and root for the Dodgers. I'm glad that you have jumped on the Dodgers bandwagon. <sighs> Are you ready? You ready for a World Series this year? They look pretty good. A Dodgers-Yankees World Series would be pretty incredible. That'd be pretty good uh, for our <laughs> network too, because we have the World Series. Big ratings for that. All right, so we're gonna end with one of your favorite bands, The Band, playing a song by my favorite band, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. So this is Atlantic City that we're listening to right now. This is, your, this is your opportunity to, to jam out. Peter Handy, <laughs> great stuff. Thanks, Thanks for coming yeah, yeah. in. This is really fun. Uh, we'll be back next week with more of The Issue Is. We end with Peter dancing and also <laughs> images of Peter's favorite city, Venice Beach. See you next week.